Uh, for our friends who are watching online tonight, I hope you catch this part, okay? I have been forewarned that Facebook has shut this discussion down already on at least one occasion, if not multiple occasions. So Facebook does not like this conversation because it's apparently not part of the agenda, okay? <laughs> They're like, we're gonna shut you down now. <laughs> so, so for those of you who are here tonight, uh, you're gonna hear quite the treat. Uh, before we get started though, I'm gonna invite Matt to come up and give the, the, the presentation of whatever he's gonna do and then he'll open us up with a prayer and then Ryan will come up and speak to us tonight, so it's you. Hey, good evening everybody. I just wanted to share, since Ryan got to share last night, books, I, I, I get two tonight. Okay, so on the back table, this is a brand new book to us, um, Answers in Genesis, uh, the guys that have the Ark and the, and the Creation Museum. Uh, they just put this out in the last, oh, I want to say, four months. Uh, quick answers to social issues, so talking about environment and, and um, sexual per, per, the, persuasion and all the above issues that we're dealing with. Very, very good book for a biblical answer for all of that stuff, okay? Social issue stuff. And then not long answers either, okay? And then this very beautiful book. When Ken and the guys at Answers redid their creation museum a, a year or two ago, they added a whole exhibit about how we are fearfully and wonderfully made. And when they did that exhibit, they turned it into a book also. And so uh, until you can get there to the Creation Museum, this can tide you over. Um, the information in it is phenomenal, uh, along with the pictures of, of what God is doing in every mother. What, what he's doing is he designs us in the womb. Um, we're not going through an evolutionary process. We're not going through, through, through something that that's not special. It's very special. And it's very well designed. That's what this book is all about. So check those out um, on the table. Pray with me tonight as we invite Ryan. Lord, I praise you tonight for these that are here. Lord, tonight this topic, Lord, is a topic that we need to seek you about first. Lord, we... We ask for, for your forgiveness because we haven't sought you out first in your word first. We've tried to take care of this issue on our own, and Lord, it gets us in trouble. Lord, I ask tonight that you speak through Ryan powerfully. Allow us to learn and, and understand that our history is not pretty, even in this country, but around the world. And Lord, by and large, it's because we haven't looked to you to understand who we are. Lord, tonight in this place, we give you praise. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Summer, 1619. In the Gulf of Mexico, the ships, the White Lion and the Treasurer, have tracked down the San Juan Bautista and attack it. After three days of battling, the crews of the White Lion and the Treasurer finally board the San Juan Bautista and storm its holds and are ready to uncover what great treasures are there for their bounty, for them to take and make great wealth off of. And when they open the cargo holds, what they discover is not what they had anticipated. Rather, they would be contents that would eventually, many, many hundreds of years later, be deemed as a great moment in history. Now to set that all up, we're going to go through a little bit of process here of understanding our history. Before I do that, I just want to say thank you for the opportunity to come and share with you and to be back here at uh, Mountain View. Sunday morning, I got to go over to Kabul and uh, share with them. Uh, they're uh, one of our supporting churches and people over there we know. Uh, Nathan Babarkas, uh, we were in college together, played some baseball, uh, which was really fun. He's their youth guy there. And uh, as I was telling him there, you know, St. Louis Cardinals, right? Mm -hmm. We went to school in St. Louis. It was great. And funny thing, back when we were in school, 
the guys, some of these guys, you know, some of those shady guys, they always wanted to date Cubs fans. They wanted to date girls who were Cubs fans. They never had any expectation of a ring. Never did. <laughs> so, um, anyway. But thank you for the opportunity to be here. That probably got to shut down right there. <laughs> Going back from what Matt was discussing with us yesterday, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, and we went through the six days of creation, and the pinnacle, the masterpiece, as Ephesians 2.10 says, of the entire creation is what? That's right, mankind, because we are the image bearers of our creator God. Here's my question for you, though, and maybe something you have or have not thought about. When God created Adam and Eve, what color were they? Yeah. <laughs> if you listen, Matt probably actually gave you the answer. When God made them, he said they were good, meaning they were perfect. So what color were they? Perfect. <laughs> the perfect color. And I'll explain that to you at the end. But, see, we need to understand this issue, especially in the Lord's church, because of what we see in Scripture, especially in regards to eternity. After these things I looked, John says in Revelation 7, and behold a great multitude which no one could count from every nation. How many? Every, every nation and tribes and peoples and tongues. Standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes and palm branches in their hands. That means Jesus shed His blood for who? And that's what it says. Worthy are you, in Revelation 5, to take the book and to break its seals for you, Jesus, were slain and purchased for God with your blood from, how many? Every, Every tribe and tongue and people and nation. And you have made them... A kingdom and priests to our God, and they will reign upon the earth. Don't you think the church better have this issue right? So back to the San Juan Bautista there in the summer of 1619, the white line and the treasurer bored it and opened up its contents, and it was not full, their cargo holds, with gold or other precious valuables to them. Instead, it turns out this was a Portuguese slave ship. And it was filled with people. Approximately 350 slaves had been on that ship. And 143 of them had already died because of the horrific conditions in the transatlantic travel. So they perused what was left and decided to take about 60 of the best looking of the slaves and split them up between themselves. The treasurer would go down to, on over to Bermuda, whereas the white lion would go up to the British colony of Virginia and dock at Point Comfort and unload them and they would be brought to the colony of Jamestown. And this event has become synonymous with the beginning of slavery in the United States of America and currently the main foundation for what has been deemed the 1619 Project by the New York Times. Who's heard of that? Why did you say with that kind of tone? <laughs> well, as Senator Tim Kaine of Virginia once said, on the floor of the United States Senate, the United States invented slavery. In 1619. And I'm like, do you have no history books before 1619? Have you read anything? Yeah. But the United States is to blame for all this. Do you know what happened to the slaves who were brought to Point Comfort in 1619? They were slaves, right? For the rest of their lives, right? Well, if people had followed the Paul Harvey philosophy and checked the rest of the story, young people are like, who? Yeah. <laughs> you would find out that's not the case. You see, at that time in history, 
Many people wanted to come to the new world, a new chance at life, build themselves, a family, a home, strike it rich maybe, but yet couldn't afford the very expensive trip to go across the ocean. To this day, it's expensive to go across the ocean, is it not? Okay. Well, you're going to go across and, and try to find a living there. So what you would do is you would indenture yourself to someone who was already established there, and they would pay for your trip and house you and clothe you for a period of time until you could pay off all of that debt and then perhaps have the means to purchase your own land, and then you could do the same thing after that for somebody else. This was called indentured servitude at that time. Well, these 20 or odd anglins, as the record says, were brought to Point Comfort, taken to Jamestown, and placed into an indenture. After four to seven years, guess what would happen to them? They were freed, and they were allowed to go about their business and do the same thing. Now, had they come there on their own free will? No. They had been taken from their home and brought to that place, and people made a profit on them. That's evil and wicked. Let's, I, I don't want to sugarcoat anything. But what then did happen, what well, we're usually not told, is they were freed, and they got their own means, and they stayed. Because they had, they had property, they had a means of supporting themselves, they could do the same thing for others. One such gentleman, his name was, let me make sure I get everything right here. Um, my phone is very little on this thing. That's it. Use the pad. It would be great. You know, Anthony Johnson was his name. He was brought over by a Portuguese slave traders, and he was put into an indentured servitude and was working there. And, and again, not by his own free will. He was brought over and sold into that. But he uh, also met a young lady named Mary. In uh, 1623, they got married, lived a yeah, 40-year-plus marriage. They had sons, and when they had uh, finished off their indenture, they acquired land. And back then, for everyone you were willing to take on for yourself to be a master of, for them to come and work for you, you got 50 acres to help support that. Well, their sons ended up with 550 acres. That's how successful they were. And Anthony himself had 250 acres, which means he had how many people working for him? Five. Four of them were white Europeans. One was a black African. The black African's name was John Case. Notice, did it have anything to do with skin color for Anthony Johnson? No. He had four white and one black slaves. That's not what they called them. But working for him. Well, here's what ended up changing everything. The 1619 Project really wanted to be accurate. They would call themselves the 1654 Project, in my opinion, because here's what took place. Anthony Johnson is... Let's cut down here. My remote's having troubles too, man. It's not just yours. Anyway, um, it, he, his, his uh, servant, John Kayser, believes that his time has come up, that he has worked his time and that he should be free. Well, Anthony can't read, and so they have a friend, a neighbor that they trust. Uh, his name is, uh, is Robert. And so Robert Parker comes over and he examines everything. He says, yeah, I think, I think it is. I think his time is up, and so, and so John should be allowed to go. And Anthony's like, well, I don't keep him by longer than I should, so okay, he can go. Well, the problem was... John did not have all the means ready for himself yet to be able to purchase his own land and start his own livelihood. So he turns to Robert and says, hey, can I come work for you and enter into an indenture for you for a little bit longer so I can get my feet under me and get going. And Robert's like, sure, that's fine. Uh, go right ahead. Anthony finds out that John has been told he was done working for him, freed, and now all of a sudden working for Robert. What does he think's happened? He's been swindled. So he does what will become the American thing, and he sues. <laughs> he files a lawsuit about this, 
And the appeal, the court says, no, everything was done legitimately. Nothing was wrong here. You signed off. In fact, that's Anthony Johnson's mark. It's been preserved in history. And so there you go. Uh, that's just it. Well, Anthony doesn't like that result, so he does what will also become the American thing, and he appeals. And so, 1654, the court looks at this, the Privy Council Court, whatever, the Royal Court at that time, looks at it and says, no, nope, we think you have been swindled. So John is going to go back to you and be your servant. However, uh, because this was done in, a, in an ill-conceived manner, his uh, indenture will be for life. And you will have lifelong ownership of him. And that's when this all changed. Never before had anyone been a lifelong servant unless a serious crime had been committed. And that was the punishment. Never had it been for purely the ownership of somebody. It wouldn't be until the early 1700s that the Virginia slave laws would be enacted. Why does the 1619 Project not tell us this story of when this actually began? Could it be because... It's an ugly picture that the first time this ever happened in colonial America was one African man owning another African man. Now, is any of that good? No, it's awful. I don't think that's what Anthony Johnson wanted anyway. That's not what he was going for. He just wanted to make sure he wasn't being swelled. That what was being done was right. Yet that's how this happened. But for some reason, we're not told this story. Instead, over and over again, the United States of America gets blamed for all of the evils of slavery. Who remembers from their old social studies days the triangular trade route? Oh, wonderful. They have good education, Missouri, Matt. Kansas, not a single hand went up. We're not going to say anything about it. Anyway, so... You might remember this. That was the simplified version for your social studies book. It was more like this. <laughs> the 1700s saw massive expansion of global trade. It was phenomenal. But it also created a major transition regarding slavery and the look of slavery. Previous to this, I mean, it's the center of Tim King. Those who were slaves in history were who? Anybody who got captured or conquered. Whoever the prevailing empire was, if you were subject to it, you were their slave. That's just it. Okay? So when the Assyrians come in and they conquer the Bible, they conquer uh, Judah and Israel... Judah and Israel, not slaves to the Assyrians, as was everybody else in here. When the Persians come along, what happened to the Assyrians? They became slaves to the Persians. When the Greeks came along, when the Romans came along, hello, New Testament times, everyone in the New Testament who is not a Roman citizen is what? A slave to Rome. But when you see movies, videos of first century Israel, does it have the look of what we typically think of slavery, 18th century American slavery? No, because it was totally different then. You were slave to Rome, but that just meant you had to follow what they said, and you didn't have a voice in the matter. But you still had your own home, your own livelihood, you went to work, and uh, I know sometimes the Romans could be abusive, okay? But that, that's just how it was, why the Apostle Paul had such an advantage, because he was... Roman citizen had great privilege. And when they found out, remember, that they had incarcerated him, and oh, oh my goodness, he's a Roman citizen. We're going to okay. That's just how it was. But now during this time, it's not one empire conquering another. Instead of slavery being something of conquest, slavery became something of Commerce. And where was the best place to purchase slaves? Africa. The European empires divided Africa up kind of amongst themselves and fueled great 
rivalries amongst warring tribes in Africa, and whoever could conquer and bring them the most would get their favor, and we would give you more weapons, more supplies, more gold, whatever it is, food, whatever you want, if you'll go get us more. Well, we'll go get you more, because look at how it benefits our clan, our tribe, our nation. And they just kept fueling this monster, and fueling it, and fueling it, and fueling it. If you look at the Transatlantic Slave Trade Database, phenomenal resource, you will see, it will show you the major organization hubs regarding the Transatlantic Slave Trade. Notice they're European, or they're European colonies in South America. And then the major debarking stations, the major ports where slaves are brought to, you can see all along here, all along here, it's uh, mostly South America and the Caribbean. We have a few couple little ones up here in the British colonies. In fact, let me show you this one. If we take into account their estimate of 12 and a half million slaves taken from their home and put into forced labor across the, the ocean, some estimates up to 15 million, you'll see that the bulk of them went somewhere other than the United States. And in fact, it, it comes out to about 2 to 3% of them, around uh, 387,000, end up going to the British colonies. So let me say it this way. 97% of people taken from their homes and put into forced labor as slaves went somewhere other than British colonial America. Did you know that? 97%. Yet who gets the blame for all the evils of slavery? The United States. Now let me ask you this question. How responsible can the United States be for slavery in the 1600s? That's a little bit of a problem isn't it? for those who make that claim because there's no United States of America in the 1969. Yeah. Our birthday is when? 1776. Exactly. Okay, so that's kind of a problem. In fact, it's rather quite the opposite. When you look at colonial America, you, you realize that over time, we, we really kind of rule ourselves. Yes, everything had to go through the Privy Council and Parliament and the King. But for the most part, they're like, hey, you're making money, you're doing great, just keep on going. It's when we changed that, we decided we want to be our own country. But our colonies made attempts to outlaw the slave trade because they deemed it evil and wicked. Guess what the King, the Privy Council did every single time? Vetoed those laws. And one of the first things that um, our new states will do is pass laws outlawing the slave trade because they are finally free to do so. It was so bad that Thomas Jefferson, who is the main author of what? The Declaration of Independence. When he's listing all of his charges against the king, all of his usurpations... He has one big major one that he has against the king, and it has to do with slavery. Now, someone would be like, no, wait a minute, Thomas Jefferson, I thought he was an evil, wicked slave owner. If you actually took the time to crack open the history book that tells the story of Je Thomas Jefferson, or unfortunately today, you have to actually go look at the original documents now because of the way he's portrayed in current books, you will find he lived a very, very anti-slavery life. In all of his politics, everything he could do to possibly end slavery in the United States, he tried. The list is extensive. I just put a few highlights up there. But the one that is my favorite is his charge against the king. And he saves it for last. And he writes more about it than anything else in the Declaration of Independence of why the king is evil and wicked and we must break away to be our own country. And here's what he wrote. It's on page three of his rough draft and it said this. He, the king, has waged cruel war against human nature itself, violated its most sacred rights of life and liberty in the persons of a distant people who never offended him, captivating, carrying them into slavery in another hemisphere. 
or to incur miserable death in their transportation thither. About one quarter of them would die in just the trip across the ocean. This piratical warfare, the offering of infidel powers, in, infidel, infidel. Um, by the way, who is the head of the Church of England? And what does he call him? For what reason is the warfare of the Christian king of Great Britain? By the way, these are his underlines and his capitalization. I haven't changed anything. Determined to keep open a market where what? Yeah. yeah. Men should be bought and sold. Um, in his entire rough draft, there is one and only one word that is in all capitals. And it's what? Amen. When he declares that these are not cattle, property, financial means to say, they are men. All capital letters. Deserving of the same rights and liberties as anybody else. Do you now understand what he meant when he said, we hold these truths to be self-evident? That all Amen. are created equal. Yeah. See, in the day's history book, they'll say he meant only rich, white, property, only men. But is that what he meant? Sadly, 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 everything in the, in the Declaration had to be unanimously approved. And every colony but two, South Carolina and Georgia, said yes. Those two said, we're afraid we take that back home. Our uh, legislators want us to approve that. Sounds good. We love it, but we don't think it'll pass. And so, so it wasn't unanimous. That section was struck from the final draft of the Declaration of Independence. But Jefferson, he owns slaves. How do you justify that? He received his first slaves when he was a teenager because he inherited the property when his father died. And then... Um, by, according to Virginia law, he was not allowed to free them. So by law, he had to keep those slaves. Yeah, but he purchased slaves. Yeah, like up to 600 at the time. Yeah. Do you know why he purchased them? To reunite families. You should read how he treated them wonderfully. Well, the very, very, very kind master um, did everything he could to make the situation uh, well. And he would have freed them upon his death, but because of his very lavish lifestyle and uh, the money he'd spent on purchasing these slaves and everything else, he had great debt when he died, and so by law he was not allowed to, they were not allowed to be free upon his death. And all of them in their journals, after he dies, July 4th, 1826, that auction. That happened afterwards, he said, it was the saddest day of their lives. Because they didn't want to leave on each other. So that was Jefferson. If you want to know about Sally Hemings thing, talk to me afterward. I don't have time to cover that tonight. <laughs> George Washington was a little different in his progress. He had been raised in a slave culture, had inherited slaves as well, and had just lived a a regular master's life on his plantation, though his treatment of them was very much like Jefferson. Very kind. Um, did his best with what situation he was presented. If one of them were ever to grow sick or be injured, he would personally go to them to help take care of them to make sure they were fine. Um, if discipline was to be enacted, it could only be done if he had personally investigated it and had given written permission. It was not left to the slave masters to decide. He had to be judge because he did not want any um, abuse with the, with the position. He then leads the fight for independence and freedom. And he meets a lot of friends, makes a lot of friends who are from colonies that uh, believe this is wrong. And has a very profound effect upon him. And he grows, as you can see in his letter to Robert Morris of Pennsylvania, 
to very much hope that this will eventually go away. And he signs any and all legislation, uh, the Northwest Ordinance and all that kind of stuff that outlaws slavery in further territories, tries to put an end to it the best that we could at that time. We're a brand new nation. We're working on this. And is the president of the, Con of the Constitution Convention where we outlaw the slave trade up 20 years. It was put in the Constitution. This will end in the United States. It'll never happen anymore. And it did. The slave trade ended. It didn't outlaw slavery, but it ended the slave trade. And upon his death, because he did not have any debt, guess what was allowed to happen to all his slaves? They were free. And by Virginia law, he had it stated they could never be re-enslaved ever again in their lives. And if they were too young or too old or were in a fir infirm, they, they couldn't take care of themselves, his estate would provide for them the rest of their lives if need be. Into the 1830s, there were still former slaves who were being taken care of by his estate. He died in 1799. Don't you think we need to tear a statue down? So this is the progress of what happened in the United States and at our founding. However, things over time began to change as a new worldview was being developed that saw great potential of us being a great empire and that we have a manifest destiny to rule over all this land. And thus you had the Missouri Compromise, as I'm sure you all know in your history classes of what took place there. We can allow slavery here, but nowhere else above the, 39th, the 36th parallel. That was done by, um, um, but that was followed then by the Kansas-Nebraska Act, where um, Stephen Douglas, who will eventually run for president against Abraham Lincoln, says, well, let's just let the people decide in each state. Okay, when they become a state, well, they make their own choice. And thus, you have the, the very bloody events that took place in Kansas history following all that, the fighting for whether or not they would have slavery or not. And then you had the Dred Scott case in 1857, where the Supreme Court ruled 7 to 2 that no African person, doesn't matter if they're free or slave, is a citizen of the United States and are not entitled to any of the protections of the United States Constitution. Don't you think some of those great political analysts we've heard this year saying we should never overturn Supreme Court precedent? Don't you think we should listen to them? Supreme Court's always exactly right. Yeah. That will be overturned by the 13th and 14th Amendments that outlaw slavery and grant citizenship to everybody in the United States after the Civil War. What's great about that, by the way, uh, the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court then was Roger Taney. He's the one who had to give the oath of office to Abraham Lincoln. <laughs> Is that not great? The guy who made that decision had to swear in the president who would end slavery forevermore. American history is great. Even when we have these terrible, terrible blights on our record, again, we don't want to sugarcoat anything, cover over this. We want to learn from it yeah. and see how these things happen because there's a major change in the culture at this time. This is Carter Godwin Woodson, incredible man. He is the second ever African American to graduate at Harvard with a PhD. He is the one who um, writes this uh, great journal, the Journal of Negro History, beginning in 1916, because he wanted people to know their history. And he's the one who eventually is the one, uh, started Black History Month to coincide with all of that. So the guy has incredible credentials, was a great researcher, and people don't want to read his research. Because he exposes what was going on in the culture of that time. In 1924, he published his findings of surveying the 1830 census. The 1830 census is used a lot regarding the, the state of slavery in the United States. It's kind of looking at, that's where we're really hitting the pinnacle now of doing our own thing since the slave trade's been outlawed and really expanding in the ways that it could expand, pinnacling, you know, the, the antebellum era and, and into the Civil War. And here's what he found. He discovered that 43% of free black households in South Carolina owned slaves. So those of African descent who lived in the South, in, in South Carolina, who were free, nearly half of them owned slaves themselves. Well, that seems rather peculiar, doesn't it? 
He found 40% in Louisiana, 26% in Mississippi, and 25% in Alabama, and 20% in Georgia. Why? Because the culture has changed so greatly that in order to be accepted in the culture and to society, one of the greatest symbols of your societal ranking was that you what? <laughs> to the point that when the whole Indian relocation was taking place, remember? Andrew Jackson, Daniel Boone, all that conflict. Okay, I'm sorry, Dave Crockett. Um, <coughs> Daniel Boone was actually at an event with George Washington. That's a whole other story. It's really neat. But anyway, um, David Crockett, all that stuff was going down. When it finally happened and the Native Americans were being moved from the eastern states into the western territories, came right through Missouri here, um, they brought along with them their 4,000 plus slaves, African slaves, that they had shown to President Jackson was indication that they were of a higher level in society and therefore did not need to be removed from the white man culture. How many of you knew that? That the Native Americans had their black slaves with them on the trail of tears. Because they had been told that was how to achieve in society and maintain their freedom. What's amazing to me is in the midst of that culture, there were people who stood up against it and actually wanted nothing to do with that. And you're like, why is there a picture of Robert E. Lee then on the screen? Did you know that Robert E. Lee abhorred slavery? Yeah. That he, his wife in particular, and his mother-in-law were very much trying to end slavery. And he was doing the best he could. And the day he was allowed by Virginia law to free his slaves, guess what he did? Freed them. Which creates the great irony of the Civil War that Ulysses S. Grant, the general of the North, his wife's family's plantation slaves were not freed until after the war, whereas Robert E. Lee's were freed before the war. <coughs> so during the Civil War, the leader, the general of the North, technically owned slaves while the general of the south did not don't you love your history when you actually know it this is what i tell you the man who's most impressive stonewall jackson he owned six slaves Hetty and her two sons cyrus and george they've been gifted to them and so by law they were not allowed to free them albert who had known of Jackson and how he treated everybody, begged and pleaded for Jackson to purchase him so he'd come serve and live in their home where he knew he'd be treated wonderfully. Same thing happened with a young lady named Amy. And then there was Emma, a four-year-old orphan who had a learning disability and the old woman who took care of her didn't couldn't do it anymore and no one else would take her. But while Thomas's wife, Mary was gone on a trip. He went and purchased her. And when she got him, he said, honey, I have a, I have a surprise for you. I want to take this little girl and raise her as our own. And he did. His, uh, his preacher said that uh, there was no greater friend to the black man than Stonewall Jackson. He personally would teach their Sunday school classes when no one else would. He wanted them to know First and foremost, the importance of this in their lives. If you know anything about Stonewall Jackson's life, you will know he was a man of this. And a man of great prayer. And why then would Lee and Jackson fight for the side that is defending slavery? You have to understand the mentality of the culture from the revolutionary era up to that time. Back then, we would say the United States of America are working on this treaty. Today, since the Civil War, we say the United States of America is working on this treaty. The way this was set up was that each state was its own state. Do you know what a state is? There are four characteristics, population, territory, government, sovereignty. 
We have our own constitution. We have our own elected government. We have our own military. But we work together as one nation. France is a state. Canada is a state. Brazil is a state. You see what I'm saying? And so if you were to ask John Adams, what, is, what country are you from? He would say Massachusetts. If you were to ask Thomas Jefferson, what country are you from? He would say Virginia. They said, oh. Yeah, but they would say, but we are together as the United States of America. There is a federal supremacy within the Constitution, all right? But we work together. By the way, that's the whole reason for the Electoral College. That's a whole other issue. If we ever take the Electoral College away, we just lost all of our final bit of sovereignty we have in our states. And we become controlled by one house of power in Washington, D.C. Just let you know. That's a whole other issue. We don't have time for that, okay? So what is happening in the culture in the mid-1800s that is pushing all of this to show that there is a group of people that is superior to the others. And if you want to have any chance in this life, you have to be like the superior people. 1859, there's a book that's published called The Origin of Species by Means of Natural Selection or The Preservation of Favored Races in the Struggle for Life. Now, in this book, Charles Darwin does not talk about human evolution. And that's not what is actually meant by in that phrase, the favored races. He's talking about all life. But notice what the word race means. It means a subspecies of whatever you're talking about. Now, again, this isn't the book that started it. But, as Stephen Jay Gould, longtime famous evolutionist from uh, Harvard, as he said, biological arguments for racism may have been common before 1859, but they increased by orders of magnitude following acceptance of evolutionary theory. The litany is familiar. Cold, dispassionate, objective modern science shows us that races can be ranked on a scale of superiority. And if this offends Christian morality or a sentiment, sentimental belief in human unity, so be it. Science must be free to proclaim unpleasant truths. He's saying that's what they were saying back then. <coughs> hey, the, the science, the modern science shows that there is superiority amongst the races. But notice what he then says. Their data was worthless. We never have had and still do not have any unambiguous data on the innate mental capacities of different human groups. And he's absolutely right on that. So Darwin didn't talk about it in that book, and that whole idea had been fomenting up to Darwin. But then Darwin, even though the, the Civil War happens, and we outlaw slavery, and we get freedom, did everything turn wonderful after that? You all know Reconstruction. And what happened after Reconstruction? It just, Jim Crow, it just ignited this issue of how do we treat people who look different than us. Darwin will write later in 1871 a book entitled The Descent of Man. And that one, he does talk about human evolution. Let me just give you a little synopsis here of what he says. But the most weighty of all the arguments against treating the races of man as distinct species is that they graduate into each other independently in many cases, as far as we can judge, of their having intercrossed. Man has been studied more carefully than any other organic being, and yet there is the greatest possible diversity amongst capable judges whether he should be classified as a single species or race, or as two, as three, as four, and he goes on to list all these guys who have provided their scientific papers trying to show how many races there are in the world. At the present day, Civilized nations are everywhere supplanting barbarous nations. Ooh. Excepting where the climate opposes a deadly barrier, and they succeed mainly, though not exclusively, through their arts, which are the products of their intellect. So what's going to happen to these barbarous nations? At some future period, the civilized races of man will almost certainly exterminate and replace the savage races throughout the world. At the same time, the anthropomorphous apes, as Professor Shahaba Afahausen has remarked, <laughs> will no doubt be exterminated. 
The break between man and his nearest allies will then be wider, for it will intervene between man and a more civilized state, as we may hope, even than the Caucasian, and some ape as low as a baboon, instead of as now between the Negro or Australian and the gorilla. You, you see the problem Charles Darwin was having. He said, right now, it, it's too difficult to tell exactly where the break is amongst the races because we still have a race that is really still too close to its primate ancestor. And as of right now, according to Charles Darwin, it's time you really can't hardly tell the difference between a person from Africa and a gorilla. We should build more statues of Charles Darwin, shouldn't we? I'm, 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 I'm sure you saw in the news people calling for his statue to be torn down. Did, did you? Did, did you? You didn't? No, that has nothing to do with what really, what really happened in history. So you had guys come along after him who were big supporters of Darwin, greatly influenced by Darwin. And they began trying to classify, like Thomas Exley, how many races there are. He had four of them. The Australians, the dark skins, the white skins, and the yellow brown skins. You had this guy, Herbert Spencer, who comes up. He's the one who actually comes up with the specific phrase, survival of the fittest. And he very much embraces social Darwinism, survival of the fittest. That means if we want our race of humanity to survive and continue to evolve, we cannot help those who are weaker. Do not give to charity. Do not help the poor. Do not help those who are hungry. Definitely don't help those who are sick because they will drag us down. And science has shown that that's what happens in evolution. We've got to not help them so that we can further evolve. Francis Galton, half-cousin Darwin, is going to come along. And he's going to coin this term in 1883, eugenics. Which means good in birth, noble in heredity. And here's how he defined it. He said, the science of improving stock, which is by no means confined to questioning of judicious mating, but which especially in the case of man takes cognizance of all influences that tend in however remote a degree to give the more suitable races or strains of blood a better chance of prevailing speedily over the less suitable than they otherwise would have had. We're going to try to help accelerate the evolutionary process through our science of eugenics. Here were his takes on race. He said, every long established race has ne necessarily its peculiar fitness for the conditions under which it has lived, owing to the sure operation of Darwin's law of natural selection. Let us then compare the Negro race with the Anglo-Saxon, showing a difference of not less than two grades between the black and white races, and it may be more. The average intellectual standard of the Negro races is some two grades below our own. The number among the Negroes of those whom we should call half-witted men is very large. The mistakes the Negroes made in their own matters were so childish, stupid, and simpleton as frequently to make me ashamed of my own species. So many scientists will then propose different ideas of either positive eugenics, which would be accomplished through selective breeding, or negative eugenics, which would be accomplished through selective elimination. Enter this guy, Ernst Haeckel. He's the one who brings Darwin to Germany and popularizes it there. He's the one who made up, literally made this up, this, you'll still see it in science books to this day, made this whole, as Matt says, the modern version of back then, uh, Photoshop, drew these things up to say, look, we go through the evolutionary process in our mother's womb. You start out as a single cell organ, turn to multicellular, and then you go from being like a little salamander to like a reptile to finally, eventually you become a, a primate, and then you're born a human. John Dewey will take that concept and apply it to fully born people and say, you go through an evolutionary process as well. You go from being a very 
unintelligible person through all the, remember all those people that Matt showed you last night? You go through that process, an evolutionary process, growing up until finally you become fully human as an adult. Therefore, we have to divide, develop an education system that you'll be taught according to your age, not by your ability. Because you cannot be more than what your evolutionary process allows you to be. I was in public, ed public ed education for seven years. Uh, yeah. Well, a guy named Alfred Rosenberg will read Hackle. He is a nice fella. He was appointed as the leader of the National Socialist Movement in Germany by a guy named Adolf Hitler. And by the way, don't call them Nazis. That's American propaganda. They call themselves socialists, and so that's what you should call them. Okay, just let you know. That's what they call themselves. 1934, Hitler appoints him to be the cultural, spiritual, and educational leader of the Third Reich. He'll develop the, the, the ladder of the races, okay, of course, with the Aryans at the top and everyone else lower below that. He hated Christianity. He taught that Jesus was an Indo-European Nordic enclave who just happened to find himself living in Galilee, working there, and therefore, because he was a white European, he was attacked by the Jews, and therefore that's why the Jews are evil. He wanted to replace the Bible with Mein Kampf on every pulpit as the sacred book of Germany, replace all the crosses with, with, with swastikas, That's what was happening in Germany. So the mentality was there. But the process of applying eugenics wasn't developed in Germany. They got that from the American intelligentsia. A guy named Charles Davenport, professor at Harvard, considered to be one of the leaders of the American eugenics movement. Big fan of Francis Galton, Darwin's half-cousin. He'll write a textbook that will be used in many, many uh, colleges, universities throughout the U.S. By 1928, there were 376 university courses on eugenics with 20,000 students enrolled. You'll notice all kinds of different groups, foundations, even African-American groups who were supporting this. Even women's groups were supporting this. Because they were being told this is the science that will eliminate all of the bad stuff in society. So the Women's Temperance Union and the big push for the 18th Amendment, prohibition, which I'm not necessarily against getting rid of alcohol, but you know, the reason behind all that was because they're being told eugenics will get rid of deadbeat husbands. So they're all big supporters of it. He founded the American Breeders Association, Davenport did, and it wasn't for dogs. It was to, quote, investigate and report on heredity and the human race and emphasize the value of superior blood and the menace to society of inferior blood. And in order to help this along in society, we're going to need people who are going to help us get rid of those being born that are not of the right level of society. Bam. There she is. This is when I got cut off last time. <laughs> <laughs> she was an avid eugenicist, and her clinics were always found in poor and minority communities. Where do you find those clinics today? In nice gated communities? There's a reason why those clinics are put where they're put. She did speak at, the 1920, at a 1926 KKK rally in New Jersey. However, however, if you ever see any pictures, photographs from that event, they're not real. Okay? Uh, they, those have been doctored. Right. That there are no actual surviving, from everything I've seen in my research and study, there are no actual photographs that survive. Because actually, I can say a whole bunch of other stuff about it. She was very, very controlling of her publicity. 
and what pictures could be published of her or not. And they always had to make her look like a nice, homely housewife. She's just like everyone else. So you can go to county fairs and read signs like this about from the American Eugenic Society about how unfit human traits can be breeded out through eugenics. You can see charts about what makes it eugenic or not eugenic and how you inherit these traits such as feeble-mindedness, epilepsy, criminality, insanity, alcoholism, pauperism, poverty. And many other things. You inherit those things so we can get rid of them. I mean, come on. How many of you raised any livestock? Been around livestock? Okay. Yeah. I mean, come on. Are we Americans to be so careful for the pedigree of our pigs and chickens and cattle and then leave the ancestry of our children to chance or to blind sentiment? This is what the science of eugenics will change for us. We even develop new ways of measuring whether or not you qualify. Henry H. Goddard, Goddard 19 twin at the, 1910, at the Annual American Association for the Study of the Feeble-Minded Meeting, proposed a system of classifying mental disability based on your intelligence quotient. The IQ test. And there's the scales. 70 and under, you're feeble-minded. 80 is still questionable. But definitely 70 or under, that's the divider. These will then be used for standards in public schools and immigration and even in courts. There's this guy, Carl uh, Brigham, who comes along, does a study in 1923 about World War I Army vets and says that uh, obviously the Nordic race is the superior one. They do the best in these tests. Um, he'll eventually develop his own test called the Scholastic Aptitude Test. And it'll be based on these things that the Immigration Act of 1924 happened. Now, this is not a discussion about immigration. That's a whole other thing. What I want you to know is what happened here in the 1924 Act is that we used the 1890 Census to create a level of how many people from each country or nationality or race will let into the country. This is 1924. We've had the 1900 census, the 1910 census, and the 1920 census. Why are we using the 1890? Because the 1890 census had the lowest percentage of Jews. Therefore, if we use that one, the maximum amount of Jews allowed in our country will be the lowest it can be. And we're also going to use the IQ test, which Goddard will admit later on to Congress that actually that doesn't measure intelligence. That just measures how well you're familiar with American culture. Needless to say, all these people trying to integrate in, that can't happen. We accept only 21,000 Jewish refugees from around 1938, 1939 through 1943. In fact, some historians estimate that around during this period, in the 1930s or the 1940s, because of our new standards, we turned away around 6 million Jews trying to get into the United States. Does that number sound a little familiar to you? In the midst of this, I'm telling you this case to set up another case. And by the way, now that we're to the court cases, we're getting close to death, okay? Just letting you know, that's a good mark that we're, that we're starting to wind this down. 1905, Jacobson versus Massachusetts. City of Cambridge, Massachusetts enacted forced mandatory vaccination because of the 1902 smallpox outbreak. Preacher Henning Jacobson had lived in Sweden when he was a young man, had received his shot, and had a very bad reaction to it. And uh, he thought it was just something wrong with him. He said, quote, he had extreme suffering for a very long period. Well, when they were in America, his son got his shot, had the same kind of reaction. So now he thinks it must be something in, in our blood, something inherited, it's just some kind of trait we have. Well, then this mandate comes along that they all have to take the shot. And he's like, no, we've already been down that path. We, we don't want to do that. And they're like, no, you, you don't realize you don't have a choice in that. 
by law you have to take it because we say you have to. He's like, but that could really harm me and my child. So he files suit and eventually makes it to the Supreme Court where the court rules in the 7-2 ruling, the government has the power to mandate medical procedures that are, quote, reasonably required for the safety of the public, believing, quote, the rights of the individual in respect of his liberty may at times, under the pressure of great dangers, be subjected to such restraint, even if the procedure posed a cruel and inhumane risk to that person's life. If that is the case, the court, if it's feeling good that day, can intervene and say they don't have to take the procedure. By the way, that's still the judicial precedent to this day, in case you didn't know. There has never been an overturning of this court case. That the government can mandate medical procedures to the public if they deem it necessary. Because this came right in the midst of what movement? The eugenics movement. And therefore the government, because we have a higher IQ score, can tell you what you have to do. One of the guys on this court is a guy named Oliver Wendell Holmes Jr. He's one of the justices. He's going to be on the court in 1927 when Buck versus Bell happened. Forced sterilization had become compulsory sterilization, become law in Virginia in 1924. 18-year-old Carrie Buck supposedly tested through her IQ test at an age of nine in her abilities, even though she's 18. Her 52-year-old mother, Emma, tested at age eight. And her mother had lived a life of immorality. None of her children knew who their fathers were. And so Carrie turns up pregnant at age 18 because you know that lifestyle is inherited according to eugenics. So she has been committed to an institute, the Virginia State Colony of Epileptics and Feeble Minded, and therefore, she's going to be forcibly sterilized. Well, they had some people file suit on their behalf, but the court ruled eight to one that compulsory sterilization of the unfit is constitutional for, quote, the protection and health of the state. Because remember, the 1905 ruling for that, you're looking at Oliver Wendell Holmes Jr., who was on that previous decision, concluded, quote, three generations of imbeciles are enough. The only thing standing in the way of that judicial precedent as law in the land today is the 1990 Americans with Disabilities Act. That's it. Uh, by the way, it was found out later that the family who had been taking care of Carrie, one of their nephews had raped her and they didn't want the public to find out, so they had her committed to that institute. Because of these and others, 32 states enacted eugenics programs in the United States. By 1937, Fortune magazine reported that two-thirds of all poll respondents supported eugenic sterilization programs. From 1907 to 1963, that's how recent this history is, over 64,000 people in the United States of America were forcibly sterilized under eugenic laws. 60% of them were women. California, California performed nearly 20,000 of them. North Carolina's program, again, if you had an IQ score of 70 or less, you could be subject to it. So there are stories, they, these stories didn't come out until starting to the 1990s. I left my book in the van. There's a great book called The War Against the Weak by Edwin Black. It's a book about that thick. It's about the American eugenics program. Um, Stories finally start coming up in the 90s and in the 2000s that people would finally share that they were one of those who had been sterilized. I mean, why would you ever let anybody know that? Because what had your government said about you? What had society say about you? They would just, a boy and, and a, a brother and sister would be out playing in the yard and an unmarked car would come in from town, grab them, 
They're in the hill country, wherever, take them into town, do the procedure, bring them back, drop them off. Their parents never knew they would take them. You see why Matt's presentation last night about human evolution is a little important. Nineteen eleven Carnegie Institute report explored eighteen methods for removing defective genetic attributes. Method number eight was euthanasia. The most commonly suggested method of euthanasia was gas chambers, but most in the movement thought America wasn't quite yet ready for such large scale programs. Guess who was? In fact, at the first International Congress of Eugenics in London in 1912, 42 of the 58 research papers presented were by American eugenicists. Americans led the way in this. Euthanasia Society of America was founded in 1938. Rose Marie, known as Rosemary Kennedy. I'm going to give you two individual stories to show you how this impacted individual lives. Due to Spanish flu happening, she was born in 1918. Spanish influenza epidemic. Uh, the doctor was delayed in getting there, so the nurse ordered her mother to hold her in for two hours. Her head was stuck in the birth canal. So had a major deprivation of oxygen. She was finally born at age two. She still was having trouble sitting up and crawling and walking. At age 15, she was sent to the Sacred Heart Covenant in Providence, Rhode Island for special tutoring. Her skills were deemed to be at the level of a fourth grader. She kept a diary though, there in the 1930s as a teenager. She could actually write out some things and it showed her loving life. She would go to, on trips to the opera she would go have special dress fittings with her sisters. Um, she's the third child of Joseph and Rose Kennedy. Her older brother was Joseph Jr. and John F. Kennedy. Okay. And she would go to tea dances. Her brother, John, would take her and escort her. And everybody said you would never know there was anything wrong. And John loved her and, and they had a great life. Um, she could and loved to read Winnie the Pooh. All right, that was her favorite. Um, well, with her father as a U.S. ambassador to the U.K., she attended the coronation of the Pope in Rome. She had trips to the White House. Pretty, pretty wonderful life. The press was always told that she was uh, studying psychology or she was going to be a teacher or she was going to social welfare, whatever they wanted to tell them at the time. So... 1938, age 19, she was presented as a debutante at uh, Buckingham Palace. For those of you who don't know, think of Cinderella. Every year in the, the, the beginning to the great social season of uh, society was a debutante, a debut of all the new eligible ladies in the kingdom. And all the eligible bachelors would be there to hopefully find themselves a young bride. And the girls are hoping to find themselves a young groom. And that was the beginning. Well, she, because they were in England at the time, she got to participate in that event. That's a picture, or the previous one. I'm sorry, let me go back. Let me show you. That's a picture of her at that event, okay? Well, um, she was presented. You get to go before the king and queen. It was King George IV and Queen Elizabeth I. And uh, she had practiced for three hours the, the very special curtsy. And she kind of stumbled and tripped and, and but recovered. And nobody said anything. Nobody laughed or anything. The king and queen just smiled at her nicely. And I don't know what happened. And neither do any of her siblings. But when they got back from that trip, she began to really regress. And at age 22, she was having major outlashes. Um, lots of problems. Um, she was becoming violent, so they um, committed her to um, a covenant school in D.C., but she was sneaking out at night. So her father, because of the time error we're talking about, was told by doctors of psychosurgery known as lobotomy. 
And Joseph Kennedy approved the surgery in November of 1941. Dr. James Watts and Dr. Walter Freeman performed the procedure. I have their personal testimony as to how the procedure went. I'm not going to read it out loud, uh, especially with children in here. Needless to say, afterward, she was left unable to talk or walk. And so they had to commit her to uh, St. Kalita School for Exceptional Children in Jefferson, Wisconsin for the rest of her life. Her mother would never, wouldn't see her for another 20 years. Her father would have a stroke in 61, which is when Kennedy is inaugurated as president. The, um, it's after that stroke that the family is finally told. They had never been told what had happened to her, to their sister. They had no clue. So it's when John F. Kennedy is in the White House in 1961 that he finally finds out. Well, they don't tell anybody. They just say that um, they say that she's, she's been diagnosed as mentally retarded, and therefore she's been committed to that school. And so it was very sad. You know. Finally, after he and Joseph Senior dies in '68, the family, the siblings, will start to go visit her and bring her back into the family life and welcome her back in. This is a picture of her. Um, Later in life, she'll live to the year 2005, and she'll have four or five siblings beside her when she dies. But this is the product of this era of science. How many of you knew the story of Rosemary Kennedy? Yeah, some of you did. It didn't come out until 1986 to the public. One more personal story, and then we'll wrap this up. Exotic populations became popular in various countries as human zoos throughout the world. You can find human zoos in Paris, Hamburg, Antwerp, Barcelona, London, Milan, New York, Warsaw, hundreds of thousands of people going to them. In 1904, the St. Louis World's Fair happened, and there was a gentleman, uh, Samuel Verner who was charged by the community to go over and find some exotic people and bring them back. He believed for the purpose of educating people about them and how amazing their cultures are and how wonderful these people are. He was not happy when he found out they were just pretty much put in as a human zoo at the St. Louis World's Fair. One of the young men in that group, this one right here, Ota Binga, okay, right here, was one of those young men who was brought over here. After the World's Fair, they were all allowed to go home, but he, having seen the World's Fair, by the way, this was the, had the first big electric display, electric lights there. It, you ought to read about St. Louis World's Fair. It's amazing. Um, he wanted to stay, so he's allowed to. He goes to work eventually at the New York Zoo. Okay? The, um, the Brooklyn Zoo. And there... He uh, is, you know, just doing chores and working and everything. But the the uh, the guy who runs the zoo, William Temple Hornaday, notices that he gets a lot of attraction. So he thinks, let's make some money on this, and he asks him, "Would you mind living in the primate house, and uh, we'll have a time where people can come and they can see you shoot your bow and arrow?" And Ota says, "Yeah, I can do that." So they put a sign up that said. The African pygmy, Otavinga, age 23, height 4 feet 11, weight 103 pounds, from the Cassia River, Congo Free State, South Central Africa, exhibited each afternoon during September. Guess who got upset about this and said something? Christians! Because they said this is a product of human evolution. We don't believe this is right. So... They finally raised enough stings, threats of lawsuits and everything. He was finally released to walk around the zoo, carrying his, his friend there. And eventually a preacher uh, named, I want to make sure I got his name, because he's worth remembering. James Gordon. James Gordon's a preacher who takes, um, takes Ota and helps him get cleaned up and gets him some education, gets him a job down in Lynchburg, Virginia. And Ota then decides he's going to save up money and take a trip back across the ocean and finally go home. He saves up his money to do so. And right when he's getting ready to go, 1914, World War I lets out. And all transatlantic passenger travel is, is stopped. He becomes very depressed, and two years later, 
We're not sure how old he was. Um, but March 20th, 1916, at age 32 or 33, he goes out back, makes a little ceremonial fire, and sits down and shoots himself in the heart. William Temple Hornaday is remembered today in Wikipedia as an American zoologist, realtor, conservationist, author, poet, and songwriter. He revolutionized museum exhibits by displaying wildlife in their natural settings and is credited with discovering the American crocodile and was saving the American bison and the Alaskan fur seal from extinction. You have to go way down the article to read about Otomi. Thankfully, there were some advances that happened, started to happen, 1954, Brown versus Board of Education. Separate but equal is not right. We're going to overturn that Supreme Court precedent. Are you kind of seeing why we needed a civil rights movement in the United States? See, most people today have no clue what was actually happening before that. They think it's just about being able to sit in the front or the back of a bus. That was just a microcosm. Was everything done in the civil rights movement perfect and wonderful? No, not saying that. But you see why we needed one. And why Christians should be at the forefront of Dr. King's words, where we judge people not by the color of their skin, hello, but by their what? Content of their character. 1962, Engel versus Vital, that's when the court will rule seven to one to end prayer in school. 1963, Abington School District versus Shint will outlaw the reading of the Bible publicly in schools. 1968, Everson versus Arkansas is when the court will rule that you cannot prohibit the teaching of evolution in school, even though states have that law. They said you can't have that law. You have to let it be taught in schools. 1973, Roe versus Wade, because this thing in your stomach is in your uterus what, is, is just a, a product of biological evolution or tackle taught us that it's not fully human until it's born so if you need to exterminate it go ahead but only through the first trimester after that it's more fully developed so it's up to each state to decide that 87 Edwards versus a Gilliard remember how we told you you can't prohibit the teaching of evolution? Well, now you cannot teach creation. That's out. 1992, Planned Parenthood versus Casey. Everyone thought this is when it's going to happen. We're going to overturn it. Two, the two dissenting votes in Roe v. Wade are still in the court. Plus, we've got five new ones from Republican presidents. Surely, it's going to be a 7-2 ruling to overturn Roe v. Wade. No, it's 5-4 to keep it. However, we're going to say it's within weeks, not a trimester. And then it's up to the states to decide. So we've had all this happen up into the 90s now. And then does anybody remember two young men named Eric Harris and Dylan Klebold? April 20th, 1999, they proceeded to kill 13 of their students in Columbine High School. And when they did so, Eric wore a shirt that said, Natural Selection. And Dylan wore one that said, Wrath. I mean, we've been taught now for how many years that we're just primates, we're just humans, it's survival of the fittest. I'm sorry, these people should have been able to defend themselves. I don't see why you're all upset. There's no moral code here that says an animal can't kill another animal. For its own territory, its own pleasure. Because there certainly isn't a creator God. We've been told that. Our whole lives now in school at this point, 1990. Their entire life now. That's been the what's been taught in public school. Just to put a little bit of mathematics to this, a little science to this. When we outlawed prayer and Bible reading in the 62 and 63 decision, we had 13 school shootings with 35 deaths in the entire decade of the 1960s. Immediately in the 1970s, it more than doubles to 30 school shootings, 37 deaths. 
And in the 1980s, it kind of held about the same, 39 shootings and 49 deaths. And then we outlawed the teaching of any teaching in schools about creation and that we are made by a creator and in his image, and therefore people should be treated as such. And we immediately jump, you're going to have to notice, I have to keep shrinking the ones on the left. We jump, immediately jump to 62 shootings with 88 deaths in the 90s. In the 2000s, 63 shootings with 107 deaths. And then, did anybody think in the 2010s we just kind of fell off our rocker as a culture? Now that we've had a full generation go through all this, and they're now parents, and now their kids are in school. 187 school shootings, 190 deaths in the 2010s. I did not get a chance to check today to update it. But as of last week, last Wednesday, we had, had uh, already in this decade, 55 shootings with 50 deaths. That, as of last Wednesday, equaled one shooting every 17.54 days. Understand, we're not in school all year. That's, that's the entire calendar. And by the way, we took the whole year off as well. Yeah. And that's still where we're at. Science is finally catching up to about how bad this is in some ways. It was finally in the 90s, the Advancement of Science Convention in Atlanta said race is a social construct, has no basic biological reality when it comes to humanity. In fact, those working on the Human Genome Project said, by the way, we've noticed we can't see any difference in races biologically. There's only how many? The human race. My uh, college biology textbook, evolutionary biology textbook, had this diagram here on the left. You can look at that. It's like, oh, that's good. And they were teaching us. There's only one race of humanity. I was like, hallelujah. Because tell me, at what point do you become a different subspecies of humanity? This is the level of melanin in your skin. That's what determines your skin color. Okay, and these Punnett squares here, you can see that. What rate, at what point do you become a different race of humanity? You well, know, look at the top. We all came from how many original? And what color were they? Perfect. Perfect. <laughs> they have the full, complete <coughs> genetic code from which we get all the variety we have today. I still bet when the class wanted to raise my hand, but I know their names! <laughs> oh, they have an got extra credit on that. Yeah, you go to museums today, as Matt just showed you last night, and how do they show the progression of human evolution from darker to lighter skin to this day? Still pushing the idea that we came from where? Don't you remember when you were a kid, it was the Fertile Crescent? Who remembers that? And so it's No, no, it's from Africa. Now you know why. What's been right all along? What's the Bible said about how many races there are all along? You heard it last night. He made from one man every nation of mankind. And it says we all are also his children. Hallelujah. Does that mean our work is done? Just beginning. Just beginning. You don't think this stuff ever comes back? There's nothing new in the sun, remember? Guess what's happening in Canada now? There are new euthanasia laws that are going in effect, including mercy killings, mercy euthanasia for the feeble minded, the mentally handicapped. That's where it's, it's bad. This book is so amazing. When it was written in its day, there was nothing else like it. And to this day, there's still nothing like it. I cannot tell you how monumental in the history of mankind it was when Paul wrote Galatians 3 and he said, anyone who's baptized into Christ has been clothed with Christ and it does not matter if you're Jew or Greek. It does not matter your nationality. It doesn't matter if you're a slave or free. 
doesn't matter your standing in society. It doesn't matter if you're male or female. Your identity is in who? Christ Jesus. How amazing is this book? Father, thank you tonight. We've got a little glimpse of how your word stands true always. That the not just ridiculous, but sometimes evil found in the sciences of humanity are always exposed. And Father, we ask for your forgiveness when we fall in front of Lord, help us to be discerning, to sharpen our worldview. To bring it into focus through the lenses of your holy word. That we, your people, your kingdom, composed of people from every tribe, tongue, and nation, would stand firmly against evil. But that our combat would also stand in stark contrast. That we would not fight with the weapons of this world. That we would fight with truth through the weapon of love. Lord, help us to love this world. To love those who stand against you. To show them what it's like when you have Jesus. And may that be what might bring them from the clutches of evil. May your love radiate from this place in every home, in every individual, as we try to be your beacon of life. Life eternal. We praise you for the victory we do have in Jesus, in whose glorious conquering name we pray. And those who would bear that light said,